Welcome to the latest in the Yugabyte Tech Roundtable talks. Um, today we're going to talk about um, heterogeneous data layer and uh, as well as our usual panelists of Frank Peugeot and uh, David Walker from Yugabyte, we have been joined today by John Schlesinger from uh, Temenos, uh, Chief Architect, I think. John, is that the correct job title for you? Chief Enterprise Architect. Chief Enterprise, even even bigger, um, and I, and I think uh, I'm I'm hoping that uh, I'm going to do my usual my my usual kind of balance between the panel here is uh, Frank as a developer advocate. I will be looking for stories from the trenches, if you like, for war stories from what people are actually doing. David is CTO Europe for um, Yugabyte, so I shall be anything about. Uh, anything product specific, I will look to David and John. I'll be drawing on your personal experience as much as I possibly can. But back to back to David. I'm I'm hoping because I I want to keep this away from. This is not a product pitch. This is not a a Yugabyte is a, is great kind of a webinar. It's a general conversation. So hopefully we we won't dive into any product specifics that David needs to resolve. But before we get going, I want to get some, some terminology clear, because when I was doing all my research and, and prep for this, one of the terms I, I was hearing was data mesh. Um, and my understanding is that's not the same as a, a heterogeneous data layer, but I, I want to hear it from you guys, um, you know, what, what your perspectives on that terminology is. And can I start with you, John, please? Um, well, I, before people were talking about data mesh, they, they were talking about things like data dial tone. But, but I, think, I think people are uh, recognizing something that some of us have been talking about for a long time, which is that in information technology, there's more than one value chain. So, so there's, a, there's the value chain of what you do, which might be you know, taking orders for journeys uh, on Skyscanner going to a global distribution service to create a passenger name record and then going to hotels and airplanes and car rental companies to, to, um, to book the travel. That, that would be the real value chain. And then, and then there's another value chain of capturing what's happening and making that into information products. Um, that, that second value chain. And I think when people are talking about data mesh, they're talking about the technology for establishing that, that, that second value chain. And, and that, that, that's the way we're, we're organizing our architecture. We, we have business events for the value chain. So we sell to banks. So it's the, the value chain of the bank. Uh, and then we have data events for the second value chain for creating information products out of what's going on. And the information products can be for lots of purposes. They can be for informing your bank customers, like in pre and post trade reporting in capital markets. Um, they can be for management information, for the management to make decisions about the company, or, or typically in banks, a lot of it is for regulatory reporting. I mean, that's a lot of what banks do. So, so the, yeah. the data mesh is really the establishment of data events in parallel to business events, and then getting them to all the places they have to go. Frank, that, is, that's is, what is, I think it's is, about. Is, is data mesh a, a term that you hear being bandied about? I, yeah, I, it, I'm not sure I can define it, but what I understand is that, that data mesh is it's as, um, at a logical level. Uh, it's above the physical level where you have heterogeneous databases in different places. Am I right about that, that it's really logical in the architecture? Rather than, uh, you mean, David, sorry. So in the, in the definition of conceptual, logical, and physical, I like the, the Gemini definition. So conceptual is what you do, logical is how you do it, and physical is with what that you do it. So, so anything that doesn't specify with what and doesn't make sense to a business person is logical. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense, David? Yeah, I, I sort of use Martin, when I'm asked this question, I tend to use Martin Fowler's perspective on the world that the data mesh is the series of data domains that are used for an application, 
whereas a heterogeneous data layer is more about the different technologies that underpin those domains and how they're used. So, so if I was looking if I was looking at this, I would say product is a data domain, and underpinning that, you may have one or more things at the at the data layer which are storing those for which are optimized towards different aspects of it. I think it goes a little bit beyond that. If you look, when people started talking about CQRS, command query responsibility separation, um, the, the, the real, there were lots of reasons for that. Um, and it, it kind of started with travel when the global distribution systems had to separate the shopping data from the uh, reservation data because the booking engines were vastly increasing the look to book ratio. Um, and, and they had to re-architect for that. that. That's now happening to every industry. It's been sped up by the pandemic. All industries are now going to self-service on mobile and internet channels. And, and when you replace the clerical worker with the great unwashed public, the look to book ratio goes from five to one to a thousand to one. Right? So, so everybody's having to, to do the CQRS pattern. But, but the underlying that is a deeper reality, I think, which is that all record keeping systems their data is second class. If you try and query that data directly, you'll come a cropper because you'll either get the query done and you'll stop the record keeping system working uh, or the query just won't get done, right? So, so I think the data mesh is about making all of that record keeping data first class, making it available to people to query um, who can't go to the database underlying the record keeping system. Okay, so I want to come back. It's to a really that. fundamental change in IT. So yeah, and and as such, I think we want to. I, I'd like to kind of talk more about some general issues, if you like, to come back to that as a you know as a this is what it's all about. But but let's lay, get some groundwork laid. I think before we do that. Um, and and the next question I have is about this word heterogeneous, which is. You know, I implying multiple databases or data engines in the data layer. Um, why can't I just have one? Why can't I, you know, just pick the best database for my organization? Or indeed, what's wrong with the database I've already got? Why can't I use that for my new services? And I'm going to start with you, David. I think the challenge that we've seen is that, I mean, they're now somewhere, if you look at DB engines, there's somewhere around 390 databases out there. And all of these databases are optimized towards different use cases from the very small to the very large from uh, analytics to reporting. And we've seen the bloat of monolithic servers like Oracle as they've moved into getting progressively larger and tried to answer all problems. And that's made it difficult for people because they are multi-purpose. So the idea of heterogeneous storage is about, uh, for me, is about the ability of using the right tool in the right place, using a hammer where you've got a nail and a screwdriver where you've got a screw. So what you're trying to do is develop uh, a pattern, but this doesn't mean go out and use every database that's available. I'm not proposing that any enterprise architect should nominate 390 databases and have a use case for everyone. It's a constrained list. It's about having um, three or four different databases which meet that business need that you have. And I think I, I was lucky enough to watch some of John's other pre presentations at the DSS summit earlier this year. He talks about the difference between um, eventually consistent and uh, transactional databases and the different needs. So I think you start as an architect in an organization by trying to model out what those requirements are and then picking the right technology, the right database, which is focused on delivering the benefit, business benefit for that use case. Okay, so I, I get that. I mean, the horses for courses, um, as you say, or best of breed or whatever. But I think that then the, the challenge that we will face trying to implement that is how do, you, what is the, if you like, the methodology, the approach to picking the right tool for the job, you know, deciding whether that's a screw or a nail. How do I, you know, what are the characterizer, how do I characterize my workload so I know what the right tool is for that? Yeah. John, John, you, yeah. uh, uh, Temenos, you, 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 you've, you've kind of like made these, you know, workload decisions and, and, and tools to support them, haven't you? Or yeah, at least so you. 
Yeah, so, so, you know, when, when I started at Terminos, you know, every single bank implementing us did it on a single database. But, but one large bank that was using us tried to query um, the part of the Terminos database that stores all of the transactions to, to, to do little slicing and dicing of those transactions for uh, information purposes. And those queries just timed out, right? And if they were to fix the problem <clears throat> by indexing that table, that table was over a terabyte in size in, in their database. And that's typical for a lot of other banks using our system as well. If they were to try and index that, then they wouldn't get the throughput they needed to, to run the database for the record keeping, right? So, so there's always been a fundamental conflict between designing a logical and physical data structure for query and designing a logical and physical data structure for update, right? And, and up till now, all of the enterprise systems have optimized for update and have therefore been very poor at query. Um, it's not, and it's not just our system, it's all of them, right? So, so in recent times, you've seen exactly what David described. You've seen some of those large single site databases uh, construct two database engines, one database engine for the updates, for the record keeping, and another database engine for the uh, query. Um, but so even it, even though they might have the same, effectively the same scheme and the same data in it, but it's, it's optimized, indexed oh. differently. For... Remember, I, I was saying it's the logical and physical structures are different for query and update. So, so you create the two database engines, right? And, uh, and frankly, quite a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt about what you use them for, right? But, but and, and some people say, well, now I've got the two, eight, two engines. I mean, so SAP HANA came from two different databases. It came from MaxDB, which was an open source Postgres competitor. And it came from T-Rex, which was actually a text database. And so T-Rex became the um, in-memory database. and or the a columnar database and uh, Mac, MaxDB came the, the, the traditional database engine. And then DBT Blue was added to um, DB2 and the Hecaton extensions were added to a Microsoft SQL server and Oracle in memory was added to Oracle, right? Um, but, but, the, but the problem they've got is that the logical structures, coming back to what Brown was saying, they're different. That the logical model of update is uh, designed to eliminate update anomalies, uh, so-called normalization. Uh, and you really want to have the least amount of data possible. You really want to construct the data so you've got just enough data that you can ma match the precondition for the next transaction. Any more data than that, and you, you make the update slower, you make your backup and recovery slower, and you make the database more expensive. But a query database is exactly the opposite. You want all the history of these transactions that's ever happened, right? And what you're modeling in the update database is going from a correct state to a correct state. In, in the historical database, there is no correct state. What you're modeling is processes occurring in the enterprise. So, so the, there's no common ground between them whatsoever, right? So that, so that absolutely obviously driven apart dichotomously. And, that, and the thing you said there that drives those apart is query versus update. Yeah. Um, and and it's not Sorry, only yeah, right. it's not only about performance. It's also the, the quality of data. If you query, if if you open query tools like business objects to users to query the operational data schema, they will probably get a lot of wrong results. We usually build the data to be able to serve queries uh with, with right data and with some cleaning and because it's the different data and sometimes also people need a snapshot of data there are some real-time reporting needs but some other just need to get a snapshot before the batch or after the batch or at midnight so it's also about about data not only performance yeah no i mean the, the, one of the reasons why you need a different logical model of Query data is to make it easy to query. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, easy and, and safe. Easy and yeah, safe. Yeah. Uh, so the the the, the, the logical met the, the meta model for update is entity relationship attribute, but the meta model for query is by uh, facts and dimensions or categories and and the measures, same thing. So that they have completely different contexts. And, and so is it 
two is that you're on a hiding to nothing mixing the two. But, but that's only one dimension of the heterogeneous layer. The, the other you dimension said that. is the one Dave, David brought up, which is eventually consistent versus strongly consistent. Um, so, so all industries now, and finally banking, uh, are going value chain. So what, what that means is that the, the person's been served, the consumer, uh, has been served by a distributor of the service, uh, which in principle can be different from the manufacturer of the service. So, you know, 40 years ago, the only way to get a British Airways ticket was to go to a British Airways ticket desk. Now, any booking engine can go through a distribution service to any airline. And that's happened in the utility business. You know, the only way you could get electricity in London was from the London Electricity Board. The only way you could get a telephone in London was from British Telecom. Now you can buy your telephone, you can go to any um, network provider and they will provide the network from a manufacturer, an actual network runner, right? So, so the value chain is there. That, what that means is that you have a distribution capability and a manufacturing capability. The distribution capability can run eventually consistent because you don't need orders to be consistent. If I'm ordering a fur coat in Paris and a fur coat in New York, Right, uh, I don't need to worry when I'm ordering one about whether I've ordered the last one already, because when you go to the manufacturer, it'll come back and say, we've, we've had to back order one of those two. It's a safe thing to be eventually consistent in distribution. But in manufacturing, you have to be consistent. So, so your, the distribution layer in all of these value chain architectures should run eventually consistent, which is why Salesforce doesn't use transactions, right? They don't need to. Right? But, 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 it, but moving money around in banks, you have to be strongly consistent. So it's, and, and even if the same database management system can run either consistent or eventually consistent or strongly consistent, you'd have to implement it twice, once for the distribution need and once for the manufacturing need. So you, you've got to have at least three different database types in your heterogeneous layer. The eventually consistent distribution, the strongly consistent manufacturing, and the um, tuned for reporting. query database for the reporting. What do you think, Dave? Is three enough anymore? Uh, well, some of the stuff that I've viewed, which I know John will disagree with me, is viewing the event store as a fourth di dimension to this when people put it in Kafka or Pulsar, but, uh, because uh, people do do stuff with that these days. But uh, I I'll, limit, I'll agree with John for the time being. I know that some people- I agree to... with you, David. Messaging's always been a database. Yes. I was in the lab that invented MQ, right? I yes. was there when they invented it. And uh, I, I asked, you know, I knew the designers and I talked to them about it. And they said, well, we're taking the bottom layer of DB2 and putting a different access method on top. And that was MQ yeah. in 1994. And I think, yeah. Just the database with a different access method. Yeah. Oracle, 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 uh, Queuing is the same thing. They, they put yeah. a different access method on top of the Oracle Storage Manager, and you've got a messaging system. What yeah, that's pretty. No, oh, go on, John. No, no, I was going to ask John a question. What do you think of things like uh, where, you know, that interaction about the use cases? Is it just for you um, part of that messaging across between the different the manufacturing distribution, or do you see other uses for that event la event layer? Um, so we, we, we spoke a little bit before about the data mesh. Uh, one of the things you want to be to, to make the database, data, data mesh do is store as little as possible intermediate data, right? So, so that there's always a five stage process to get from creating something new and it to be available in a, for reporting. So you have to have data collection, then you have to organize the data so it's in a common data model. Then you have to make it selectable, as, as Frank was saying, you have to make it clean and easy to query. And then you have to make it specific to a particular need, right? And in the past, what we've done is we've created a data landing area for the data collection. So that's a lot of data storage. So some people call that a data lake. Then for the organization, they call it an operational data store, and that's more data storage. Then, then they create a, an atomic data warehouse, a, a, an atomic star, that's more data storage. And then from that, they create reporting databases. 
right? What, what, what the messaging layer should achieve for you, or what the data mesh should achieve for you, is going from data collection to reporting without any intermediate storage. Right? And because the messaging is effectively a database, you've got the possibility of doing that. But what you have to be able to do to make that work is store the messages for message replay if you ever need to recreate anything, right? But, but the, today's architecture, that somebody was saying on a call I had yesterday, that they call data oil, but actually in this architecture, if you're storing everything that many times, it becomes plastic. Data is the new plastic. Right. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> oh, no, it isn't. You, 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 the, the, the goal of the data mesh should be to, um, to, 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 to make logical, not physical, all of these movements, all of these changes to the data, and only have it stored where you need it for update and where you need it for query. So I'm, I'm going to pull this back to um, the microservices and microservices application development. One common pattern you see there is every service or maybe a, a close knit family of services will have their own database, their own schema. And which may be using, you know, I don't know, Postgres or whatever. And another family might also be using Postgres, but they'll have a separate instance. We have, you know, database instances kind of per service or per group of services, even if it's the same technology versus having one great big database that serves all of the, you know, all of the reporting or all of the um, systems of record, John, as you were talking about. What, David, what's your, what's your take on that? Because I know you've spent a lot of time doing microservices. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's about scale. It's about what you need to do. So if you're going to have a microservice, characteristics are about having it highly available. You don't want, if your backend, your uh, database is a single database sitting behind this, then if that database goes down, all your microservices go down and that's just bad news. Um, so what we're looking at is having a sufficient number of databases or sufficient resilience in the backend to be able to ensure that those microservices, even if one goes down, that all the others stay available. And you see this with um, graceful failure, where a microservice on a website, on a, a shopping page or something, might, uh, first of all, uh, look for the most suitable product for you based on your previous queries. But if that microservice doesn't respond, the, the widget is populated in the front end by actually a generic answer, but serviced by another microservice. That requires having access to the different parts of the data, the different insights for, to come from different databases, because if your database is gone, you can't answer either of those queries. So building that out is about having um, the microservices being able to do it. Now you get some small microservices, in which case sharing a database is not a bad thing, uh, but for all of your key systems of record and systems of engagement type interfaces, you, they're going to have a lot of data. They're going to be big, fast, transactional. Um, and what, what you want to do, if you're putting stuff into shopping cart, you want to know it's gone into the shopping cart, even if, as John says, you, uh, the stock isn't there then to subsequently fulfill it. You actually do want to know that it's gone into the shopping cart uh, as a user for that, for that experience. So building those microservices relies very much on having uh, enough, enough instances of a database. I probably want to touch on one thing which I think is important around this, which is the choice of API. Um, we've seen a growth in Postgres, phenomenal growth in Postgres over the last 10 years. If your database, uh, choice of database technology has a Postgres API, regardless of what the underlying database is, uh, then if it's truly wire compat compatible, code compatible with Postgres, it gives you that ability to move across from one database to another, to actually move um, across the databases, uh, move, move, the, move between databases if you need to, to take advantage of scalability or to take advantage of resilience or security models or whatever it is. So if I was architecting for an enterprise at the moment, I would be looking for databases which give me that, regardless of the class they're in that um, John was talking about, 
I would be looking for that true code compatibility with Postgres so that I can actually choose one way for developers to write, as well as the ability to choose different database engines to actually provide the services. Frank, yeah, I mean, there's no doubting what David's saying about the, the rise of Postgres, but do you are you seeing it being used as kind of a lingua franca, you know, in the way that David describes it is, is uh, or at least there's Postgres cap, uh, you know, compatibility, and therefore that makes a database more acceptable than if it's plowing its own furrow with a different, um, you know, a different API. Yeah, the advantage with Postgres, but it's also the case of Oracle, uh, the API offers also the ability to store documents in JSON to query with analytic queries. So you, you can really do everything. But then it comes also to the skills of people. If, if you, uh, it's depending on, on the size of the company, a medium company probably cannot have in IT people who are skilled enough uh, to code for MongoDB, DynamoDB, uh, Postgres, Oracle, and all, all that. And it can be easy for people to start with what they know or what they want to know, because I've seen some uh, CV driven decisions like, oh, MongoDB looks cool. I want to learn it. The next project, I will do, do it in, in MongoDB. But then you need also people to, to, to go into this code later. So the advantage with Postgres and Postgres compatible databases, a lot of people know it. Young people, uh, seniors, and uh, people who have been working in the query side in data warehouse, they will still, maybe they will uh, use different functions, but they will still use the same concept, the same data type, in uh, in OLTP and, and and vice versa, so, so for, for, for me it's safe to have something that is known by a lot of people uh, that you can hire or who can change from a department to another. So the, that's that's a kind of an argument for homogeneity, I, the sameness, yeah, versus what uh, John and and David have been also talking about is well, yeah. You know, heterogeneous because there are different workloads and therefore we need to have different engines to address that. So it sounds to me like there's, there's a bit of a bit of a clash here. John? No, no, we're talking about two different things, right? Um, but the homogeneity um, at the API level it has two, two parts to it. So, you know, there's the JDBC part and there's the SQL part. Right. When you talk about Postgres being your preferred way of doing things, what that means is you want to talk the Postgres version of, S of SQL, right? Um, which yeah. actually has got literally nothing to do with an API, right? The, I mean, before JDBC and ODDC, uh, there were different APIs for all the different relational databases, um, and that, that was a, a major problem. In fact, I, I was uh, chief architect for Edera SQL, which was an early solution to that problem. And became, you know, we helped invent ODBC with Microsoft. And then, then when Java came along, we got JDBC. So, so, and in fact, you can use JDBC to access non SQL databases. So, the, the protocol for going from the program to the database management system can be the same, even if the logical and physical models of the data are completely different. So, so we're really talking about two different things. Now, in Temenos, we don't let any of our application programmers do any of that. They talk to our data layer, right? And then we translate that to, we were used to have to do it, you know, we used to have to write our own data drivers for all the different APIs. Now we, we generally use JDBC, even for the no SQL databases. Uh, and then we can configure um, when we deploy the service, whether we want it to run on Postgres or, or Yugabyte or uh, Mongo or whatever. Um, so, so so, so that's a different thing. But coming back to microservices, right? If two microservices share a database, they're not microservices, right? They're, they're pretending to be, right? The whole point of microservices is that instead of sharing data between your applications, between your parts of the application through implicitly through the database, you, you, each one has its own database and they share data explicitly through messaging. 
that the, it's two different ways of writing the same application, the monolithic database way or the microservice messaging way. Right. But when you say sharing the database, you mean sh sharing the data or sharing the database engine? Instance. Yeah, it means, that's what... it means one service writes data and the other service can read that data. So, but they can what... write to, to the same database engine, but two nodes because one is a read replica. No, 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 no. Is it the same or, or not? Okay, the way a monolithic application works, and it could be Temenos T, you know, Transact, or it could be uh, SAP, right? They, they all work the same way. They have, they have myriads of components running, uh, and all the components talk to the same schema, right? And, and they, they can read and write that schema. And you put in place a local architectural constraint to, to stop it failing. So in our case, the constraint is when you create a new application on the platform, it has to, it creates its own tables and it can read and write its tables. It can only read other tables. So that way you never get two applications trying to write the same table, right? So you have that kind of constraint, but, but, but they all share the same schema. Right? So what are the things, <laughs> sorry, John. So, so when you go to microservices, what you're doing is you're saying all of those applications will have their own schema, whether it runs on the same instance of the DBMS or on its own instance of the DBMS, that's a configuration choice, right? But logically it has its own schema, right? And, and if you need data from somebody else, you listen to their change messages. And if you want somebody else to do something, you publish your change messages, right? It's a, yeah. and now distributed system, and the golden rule of distributed systems was don't, right? <laughs> so, so don't one don't do microservices unless you're very very clear on your architectural constraints. David, I think you had something to add to that. Yeah, I, I was going to agree with John when I said about sh microservices sharing a database. I should be more explicit and said database instance rather than database. So, you're right to pull me up on that. And John is. Yeah, God, God forbid that anybody goes back to sharing schemas. The, the amount of code that you've had to unravel, or we've all had to unravel in our past for doing that is a, a nightmare. So very much, but this also leads to some of the other interesting features because um, yeah, if you've got a distributed database, you may have the same application in different places with different, uh, different application layers, or same application layer deployed in different places. And then you get into ideas of uh, data distribution as well and keeping right, the right data in the right place. So same application, but it's running in the US and Europe and a distributed database needs to store the data that's come from Europe in Europe and the data that's come from the US and the, in the US within one instance. So that actually that's gets quite difficult um, scaling things with that. Go on. Don, and you also have no, no, the yeah. sovereignty as yeah. well. Yeah, which yeah. Is um, if you're in, if you're in healthcare or, or finance, you're you're in a, a highly regulated industry, and the regulator in some jurisdictions will say the data has to stay in the jurisdiction. So so if you set up your application so it has three hubs, you know one in the US, one in Europe, and one in Asia Pacific, um, and you you start working in say Indonesia, which has a data sovereignty requirement, you have to create a, a new instance in Indonesia. And guarantee that none of that Indonesian data ever goes to the other three hubs. So but in, in, in that in, in that case, and it leads me on to a question I was going to ask anyway, uh, but that's a nice in for me. Is there is some data, you know, if you like the reference data, which there isn't an Indonesian version or a German version of it. There is a version of it, and that that needs to be shared. But presumably, in the case of uh, a global system like that, you do not want to have one copy of it, one shared master data somewhere, because the, the latency would be monstrous. So, and, and that's a specific instance. This must happen. This happens all the time. The major entities are going to be needed by many, many services. Presumably, you have to have a, a strategy. You have to have an architecture for or what the policy is for how do we make this available to everybody in a low latency, but in an adequately consistent way. Well, what you, see is, on that? you see the same thing happening time and time again. Um, you, you write a service 
and it calls another service for data, right? And that has two implications. The service that, that's calling another service for data has now gone latent and flaky. It's gone latent because it's waiting for the other service. And it's gone flaky because if the other service fails, as David said, this service fails. So they go, okay, what, what we'll do is um, we'll call over there and then we'll cache the data, right? And that means, except for the first call for that data, it's now no longer latent and flaky. But then they say, but if the data changes over there, how do we know it's changed here? And so they say, okay, well, when the data changes over here, we'll notify this service. And of course, if they'd done that in the first place, it would never have had any problems. So, so everybody who goes into this ends up with that architecture, where instead of calling elsewhere for data, they just have the data notified to their service, right? And that's the beauty of a PubSub messaging network it's quite easy to arrange that. Everybody publishes their, their, their messages saying this data's changed and anyone can listen to that and pick it up. It's another instance of the data mesh, right? But, but the idea that one service calls around other services for data, that, that, that's, that's an anti-pattern. Frank, I'm gonna ask you about that. Yeah, this works for data that can be pushed to different places and do not need to be consistent. Uh, if, if you need to push updates to all places and, and in a consistent way, so that if people query from one place, they see the same as in the other place, uh, th this, this may be the case where you need something a bit more complex than that. Well, th th that's, what, that's why you need the, the, the back office, the, you know, the, the system of record or the manufacturing database to be strongly consistent. Yep. If you're changing the amount of money in the bank, you, you, you can't let make that, you can't make that eventually consistent. You, you yeah, but to... for, for referential data that you need everywhere, you don't have some data that needs to be pushed everywhere in a consistent way? The, the speed of lights are constant, Frank. There's nothing you can do about that. So one of, the, one of the things I think is interesting is we're thinking of how we're thinking about this is if you've got in a manufacturing system, you've got a microservice which has all the data, the big, the big data plus the reference data, then if that is already being in a distributed system, strongly consistent, all the things that John's been talking about, the fact that there's a little bit of reference data in there being done the same way is, is actually fine because it's not an overhead in the rest of the system. The, it, it's not as if we're isolating it and saying we're going to do something special for the reference data. We've got 15 tables in this microservice at the back end of the, the manufacturing side. And therefore, that it will all it'll all be strongly consistent because you're not going to put it in two databases at the back end just because it's reference or transactional data. Is that part. And reference data can be slowly changing or quickly changing. I mean, yep. the, the original messaging service was invented for distributing market data. You know, that's what Tibco RV was. Yeah. And that, that's fast changing reference data, but, but, but oddly, doesn't matter if you miss a stock tick. So, no. But, and that was, that was a perfect use case for PubSub because you could distribute that market tick to all the services that needed to know about it. So, so you can have fast changing reference data, but it's just dealt with the same way. You just notify the change. Um, Can I ask, John, in your stuff about the um, in the manufacturing system where you see the use of distributed systems over and above the availability? Then, the question: What's the so why no, yeah. why do you see distributed systems as being useful in the manufacturing system over and above just of sheer availability of having multiple nodes? Oh, so, so why why do we think we have to have a distributed yeah. database yeah. In, the, in the manufacturing component? Because you've yeah. highlighted that as the best use case, and I'm so interested in why we want. Well, one of the one of the applications that, that uses our software is a very large bank use us for the international treasury service, and that they run what they call an international demand deposit account. Um, for, and it's for it's for corporate it's for transaction banking and uh, value and, um, and and moving goods around uh, for their customers. That runs in ninety different uh, uh, time zones, with ninety different instances in our multi-instance capability across the world. So 
each of those 90 instances is running on one server in the south of England. Um, but they each run their own time zone, their, their own financial tables, and their own end of day. Right? So at any time, there are five of them at least running their close of business processing on that service. Right? So the, the people in the UK get nice response time to that service. But the people in you know, Australia and Hong Kong, that they're waiting for the latency of going across the world. So a better way to run that service, uh, which is now available with distributed database, is to have you know, a hub in Europe, a hub in the US, and a hub in Asia Pacific, and then to distribute the transactions uh, across those three hubs. And in fact, we, we have a bank running that way now in Hong Kong, that they, they have uh, one instance running in AWS and one instance running in Azure, and they, they, they use a distributed database to transact on both at the same time, right? Um, so, so as well as optimizing latency for, for the, the users around the world, and indeed catering for that data sovereignty requirement, um, uh, it also gives you um, an, added, an, added, an added capability for reliability. So that if AWS goes down because they miscon miscon misconfigure BGP yet again, um, you know, Azure is still running. Right, um, so, so that's three reasons for doing it. Um, for optimizing latency across a global service, for catering for data sovereignty, and for offering um, a better reliability. Yeah, I think it's interesting you mentioned that Amazon going down. I mean, there's a whole website dedicated to cloud providers going down, but also this concentration risk, which is coming in now, certainly in the European regulators, where having a database which can't easily move or be moved or spread across different cloud providers is becoming critical to that, um, to the nature of uh, building and installing your system. You need to have that ability to distribute it across cloud providers and not go down just because Amazon has gone down or something that's happened with it. Yeah, and, and that, the, the regulators made that plain to us uh, and it's plain in the material outsourcing guidelines they've issued um, and, and they say concentration. If you if you have more than a few banks running on your service, you you must be um, running on more than one cloud for concentration risk. Yeah. But that's that's heterogeneity. That's a different kind of you know heterogeneous in the sense that oh yeah, there's an AWS version of it and there's a Google Compute Cloud version of it. But that's uh, that's not heterogeneity. That's distribution. Yeah. So you're, you're... Uh, well, it might be. I was uh, thinking of it heterogeneity. If, if it was um, uh, a proprietary product that only ran on one or the other, then you're going to have two of them, even though they're doing the same job for you. Yeah, but um, th then you can't be strongly consistent, right? You right. can only be strongly so, consistent if you're homogeneous. So that was that was what you you were kind of. I think goes back to what uh, David was hinting at was this that the in this world then we start to see, and I guess that's what, what you were saying. You, I comes back to I think about the Postgresy thing, but it's more than that. It's about open source or cloud independent at least offerings being, kind of, not just advantageous. They become table stakes. Yeah, it comes back to the very very first point I made, which is how, why do yeah if there's 300 and whatever databases out there you need to you have a set of constraints around you you need to be able to run on many clouds you may need to pick the databases which are optimized for it for the use case that you've got so if you want to have avoid um if you want to have transactional it has to be able to run in amazon and google obviously you can't run aurora uh, in google and you can't run spanner in amazon and it, you know and have a consistent database it's just not there so something that spreads across those databases, uh, across those clouds is important and has a consistent interface and all the other things we've been talking about. But exactly the same need... is true for the messaging for the same reason. Yeah. And so you can't, you know, uh, and then added on to that, um, you, you have the other dimension of the three types of database, which is where we started with the conversation. So you need to be homogeneous and sort of transparent across Google and Amazon, for example, with your transactional, your database, but you need to have the same capability to be able to move your reporting database or your 
uh, eventually consistent database as well. You don't, you can't afford to tie yourselves in at every layer. It's actually quite a sophisticated level of tiers of what you've got to think about of the constraints on each level of I want independence at this level, but I want homogeneity when I can get it. You actually have to bring this whole thing together. But that comes I think back it's a right. question, it's partly a question of the maturity of cloud use at the moment. So most people using the cloud are sticking with one cloud provider and are starting to use the platform layer of that cloud to, to reduce their own complexity. So if you're on Azure, you use the Azure event hubs, you use the Azure um, Cosmos database, you know, you use it. Um, then if you're like us, a vendor, and you have to be on multi-cloud, you have to offer it on Azure and AWS and GCP, then you have to package for all three. But you're not operating across them. You're just packaging for the three. And then the third level is this one that's coming towards us, which is if we have to manage concentration risk, we'll have to run across the clouds, multi-cloud. At that point, you can't use the cloud native platform layer, and you have to choose a cross-cloud provider. So, so I have to go from Aurora and Spanner to Yugabun. Frank, this is something I think you mentioned to me in a side conversation, which is, oh my God, that's, that is very demanding in terms of, in fact, you referred to it earlier, in terms of um, the skill levels that you need in an organization to be able to do that. That's okay for a, a WorldPay or a Temenos, but maybe not everybody's quite that big and sophisticated. Yeah, and it's not only not only the code, but also testing, because uh, being Postgres compatible, there is the protocol, there is the syntax, but, but that can be easy to change or generate for different databases. But the behavior of transactions will be different if you run on, uh, on, on different Postgres compatible databases, for example. You can run the same code and have different results probably not from one session, but when there is a concurrency on it. And then you need to test it and validate it. And, and, and if you are a big company, you can have regression tests where you are confident and run it on the Google Spanner, on Aurora, on, on, uh, on, uh, on Citus, on uh, Microsoft. And, but nothing guarantees that you will get the same results except the regression test. And this, this level of compatibility depends. If you use a, a document database, for example, or if you use DynamoDB on AWS and you, do the, you want to do the same thing on a NoSQL database in Azure or in Google, you will have to rewrite your code, but also test all the logic. So it comes back to what uh, David and John were saying before about the, you can't just have compatibility. You need, you need to have a, a, a kind of a product that can take you across those. Maybe, you know, in John's case, like you, until you have to address this issue of cross cloud operation, John, you can have multiple versions for single cloud platforms and that's that's good enough but then that yours is an organization with the scale the sophistication to be able to manage that yeah do you think you get easier at the point where you just have to bite the bullet and no we will only go we will not rely on kind of proprietary variants for different for different cloud platforms we will go common you know cross cloud for no, for NoSQL or for SQL databases or messaging documents, whatever. I think that, that actually is going to be the next stage. It makes it easier if you have to bite that bullet, Frank. Yeah, I mean, and th th that choice kind of exists already with uh, the likes of OpenShift. Um, so you, you can run OpenShift or have it run for you on all the different cloud providers and on premises. But, but it only covers the things OpenShift covers, it doesn't cover the database. Right. But then you, you've got providers like uh, Yugabyte for the database layer. I noticed that one of the one of the questions is, well, yeah, you can run strongly consistent and be heterogeneous, and that's true, you can. And in fact, you know, I was in the lab that invented the technique for doing that. When I was a Kix developer in Hursley, we invented distributed two-phase commit. Right. But the problem is, it doesn't scale if it's if it's heterogeneous. Right. And, and it's also very prone to error um, because of log recovery. 
but you can scale distribution if it's homogeneous. So, so it's not that you can't do it if you're heterogeneous, it's just you can't do it and scale it, right? And it becomes very difficult to manage. So, so we, we never got the distributed two-phase commit working between Kix and IMS, for example. We never got it working between Kix and OS 300, OS, um, AS 400. Uh, AS 400. We, we, we never got that going. Uh, and for some, sometimes for simple reasons, like um, OS 400 had presumed commit and commits and Kix didn't. And that's a fundamental incompatibility. And then same in the standards bodies. You know, when, there was, when XOpen was standard, standardizing XA, they got XA standardized, they got AX standardized, but they never standardized XA plus, which was how the transaction managers talk to each other. So that's, that's, that's a fundamental problem. It's just too difficult to do heterogeneous to two-phase commit. So, okay. Stage. So we've got these, we've, we talked about three key different uh, workloads, John, that you introduced. Um, and then David added messaging to that as a possible fourth workload. And then we've, and we've kind of, I think, talked ourselves into the position where you're going to need to pick for each of those a cloud independent uh, product to do that. Then you're going to have to, by the way, accept you're going to have multiple instances of each of those. Yeah. We're keeping it as simple as we can, Frank, but we've still got four different technologies at least here. Next, the question I just did want to get to before we, because I know we're getting up towards the end of the hour, and this might be a bit of an open question, is I'm now, I'm a product owner or a, a, for a, for a, a, a microservice, yeah? and I want the best technology to deliver my product for business value. I don't care about you know, all this conversation you tech guys have been having about architectural layers and choices and things like that. How do I make that choice? Or rather, how do maybe you like give me an approach whereby I can make the right choice? Yeah. What do I have to do? What do, you, what, what do we need to do as organizations to become you know, sophisticated as, as Frank was talking about? How do I make good decisions on architecting? You know, is it as easy as deciding, John, well, is this manufacturing, is this distribution, is this reporting, is uh, this no, messaging? No, but once you introduce microservices um, and each microservices um, has its own schema, um, then you can choose uh, which is the best database for the use case for that microservice. So, so what, one of the big differences between a schema for a microservice and a schema for a monolithic service is the microservice is going to have far fewer tables. And it's possible that no transaction is going to span two tables. So, so then you can just take out of your database management layer all the overhead of managing cross-table transactions. And you, know, you can look at a database management system like Aerospike and see that you get you know, like 10 times the throughput for a fraction of the latency if you do that. So you, you, can, you can have new, um, uh, you can relax certain architectural constraints or, or have new architectural constraints once you're in a microservice architecture. Um, Would that be where a document database might play? Because it's not strict. If I normalized it out, it might be a multi-table uh, update. But if I build it into a hierarchy, a document hierarchy actually it turns out to be it's a single document update yeah, well that's exactly the point behind mongo yeah right. so mm -hmm. so in other um, words what you're saying is is to me if you like the product owner um you can give me guidelines or you can help me to examine my you say tell me a schema tell me your use case i you know are you doing updates you're doing queries what's your you know workload based on that and a pretty simple algorithm can help me to just decide this this is going to be a, a good uh, this will be a a good way to build the data layer for that service yeah, yeah. Are, and, you all, and are you all we've introduced four but yeah, there's a few more you can introduce so uh especially i mean in in finance fraud is a major use case and it, it, that's actually an, an instance of complex event processing and it, you could argue that the kind of database you need for CEP is different from the ones you use for messaging, 
manufacturing, distribution, and, and reporting. And then in reporting, you know, I've been talking about columnar databases, but actually there are a lot of use cases in reporting for graph databases. Um, so you might want to have a columnar and a graph database. Um, so, so yeah, it, it may not be 390, but it's more than three. <laughs> But, but for all that, you need to know all your all your data access patterns in advance. You don't have the same agility as you can have when you put everything in a relational database that can evolve, where maybe you optimize for, for data ingestion, but then you can also have different kind of use cases on the same table. When you when you define your microservices, first you need to design them to, to define them and to know exactly the access pattern for for each of them. Yeah, but, but the, well, the point I'm making is that you've got that possibility with microservices. You don't have that possibility with a monolithic application. Yeah, what so you're saying, a, John, is, is what Frank's describing is actually well, no, that may be the same schema, but that's a different microservice. Yeah, and that's so a microservice for ingestion. And another microservice for you know other other parts of the application and the and the ingest one is going to get, then share its data into the appropriate form of uh, form you know the appropriate product if you like uh, for the query or for the further processing or whatever it is remember remember the thing that's shared in the microservice architecture is no longer the database it's it's the it's the messaging so the ingester can do all the ingestion and publish the um, data on the right topics. And then all, all the other microservices listening on those topics get the data and put them into their databases. I did, Sorry, uh, we're almost out of time, but I just do want to pull one thing back. Having been somebody responsible in a organ large organization for enterprise data platforms, why not have 390 databases? There are other organizational and operational constraints on it. You literally don't want to have the skills uh, or if you're going to have lots of different databases, you want people who can offer you a managed service in the cloud or whatever it has to be. But it, just because there are 50 possibilities, it doesn't mean it's a good idea to choose all 50 possibilities with this. It's important that that is a, a constrained list. It may not be three, but it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not even 30. It's not probably not even 10. It, yeah, it's, I think that those are the two things that I think we're going to take away from today. Uh, is one is how do you get that list down from 390 to 50, but not quite so far as three. Yeah. And when you've done that, if you're a product donor, how do you decide which one is the one that you're going to use this time? Yeah. Still, still leaves a whole load of um, questions, which I would, if we've got a few minutes, maybe come back to that pub, what you talked about as pub sub, um, John, is... That seems to me that is a key part of the architecture is how I'm going to do that. That's an early decision to be made. How did you do that in Temenos? Again, it's the difference between heterogeneity and homogeneity. So, so if, if, you, if, if you take our monolithic application, uh, which has you know, six or 700 applications running in one, on one platform, if you start to break that down into separate microservices, um, it's still one application, right? So the, 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 all of the uh, microservices have the same underlying conceptual data model, right? And, concept, and logical data model, they just have their implementations of it, right? And, and that means that they can understand each other's messages. So uh, but that's an advantage in PubSub. All they have to be able, to, the other thing they have to be able to do and guarantee they can do is dedupe messages, right? Because a PubSub net message network will always deliver more than once, eventually, right? You, you, it's a guaranteed at least once delivery network. So, so long as everybody can dedupe everybody else's messages, you, you can use PubSub. Now, if you're going between two applications, they don't share that logical data model, they don't understand each other's data, and you can't guarantee they can dedupe. Um, so you, you really need to consider for, for, for messages that would, you know, for business events that matter, still using transactional messaging, right? So, so application integration is transactional messaging. Microservice development can use PubSub. And the data mesh can always use PubSub because the data by definition are inserts 
and they're always idempotent. So, so th 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 there's a homogeneity requirement before you can uh, build build the services using PubSub. What, what I'm beginning to see is people fumbling the move to microservices and developing micro apps by mistake, right? So they've not controlled the, the logical model across the app, across the services, and they've become each their own application. And now you have to do application integration between them. You can't just use that, uh, an assumption of homogeneity. And, and okay, then you I'm, just I'm, I'm going to much worse ball of mud. Hmm? I'm uh, going to interrupt you now because we're kind of well, we're okay. almost at the top of the hour. Um, and thank you very much, all of you, for a splendid discussion. But I'm going to give you like 20 seconds each of you to say, so this heterogeneous data layer stuff we've been talking about, um, it sounds like it's very complicated. Should we pursue this, or is th is this a fad, or is this is this kind of another step in the convergence to the new architectures, David? Yeah, you need to do this. Microservices are here to say they're the only way that we can get the business agility in there, and get that there are choices to be made. Getting those right choices and bringing bringing them together for the requirements for each component is the way to go. Yeah, Frank, do you think people could, people are going to grasp this uh, natural? Oh, well, it really depends on the context, and and you need to do it right. If people go to microservices, heterogeneous databases, without exactly knowing what they do, just because it's a trend, then there is a risk that that they fail. So. Be careful. It's the way to go, but but uh, not just because it's a trend. It's really something that must be designed. All right. Thank you very much, Shan. I'm going to wrap it up, but I'm going to wrap it up with um, reference back to what what you just said, John. Is this is the um, this the, there is a difference between microservices and micro apps? And you talked very you know eloquently about the monolithic old styley. Temenos apps and the move to the, the new. And I kind of think for me, that's a key lesson to take away is this, you have to embrace the microservices paradigm all the way down. And that naturally leads you to say, oh yeah, the heterogeneous data layer falls out of that, you know, almost automatically. It can't be avoided at that point. So Nettle, I think that we, we all have to, to grasp, even though it seems a bit scary to me at least at the moment. Thank you very much. Excellent discussion, I thought, today, gentlemen. Thank you very much. And uh, everyone, anyone listen, anybody um, has further questions, anything else they want to follow up, you know where we all are. Please uh, do get back to us and let us know uh, what, what you'd like to be hearing about from us the next time we pull a panel together. OK, thank you very much. I'm uh, going to let you all guys all go now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Di. Hi. David, Frank. Bye. -bye.